Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the Zeitgeist uh, activists, members of the movement and those who follow our events. Uh, now we are in Oslo, my name is Olga Vlasova, I'm one of the members of the movement and I'm now sitting next to Douglas Mallet, uh, who is on the Scandinavian tour uh, to share his ideas about global sustainability. The NASA Space Shuttle program is basically finished. Um, and so none of us really work there anymore that worked on the, on the program, but I did work for the space shuttle program for three years. And so we have a question from our Zeitgeist activist from Oslo. Uh, what was the most important thing you learned from the time working uh, for this program? I, work in, uh, I worked in systems integration. Uh, the department that I worked in was called configuration management. So what we were responsible for was making sure that the blueprints, the technical drawings, the engineering orders that showed where everything went in the shuttle payload bay for any particular mission, that everything was in the right place with the right code numbers, that the systems were all working together. And we had to interface with other departments and, and whatnot to make sure that it all worked. And so that gave me keen insight as to how a large project Space Shuttle, very huge, can all work together, how the communication platforms work, the meetings, the organization, the structure, and the systems engineering itself of getting all these different systems to work together to do the mission that the Space Shuttle would be going on. So now it gave you a lot of experience for your own project also. Exactly. Yes, guess. yes it helps me with the company that I'm starting. Um, I, I come from a military background, so I had some of that already because you learned some of those. I worked in uh, naval aviation, so there's a lot that goes into uh, coordinating teams, managing projects, getting things done around aircraft. And that just kind of, it's flowed throughout my life along that, I, that, that path of project management, systems engineering, team integration, things like that. Right, and um, can you uh, tell us uh, what is the main purpose, the main message you want to convey here in Scandinavia doing your lectures? Sure, uh, I'm doing a, the lecture is titled Global Sustainability, how science engineering and technology can be used for human concern. And it's, it's a showcase of if we were on Mars, how would you live? How would you operate in a world that's extremely hostile, where you don't have a grocery store down the street to just go buy whatever you need? Uh, it's a different concept, a different world, literally. So how would you operate? How would the astronauts be able to live in a world like that on a day-to-day -day basis? Because of that thought process, you have to invent and develop key technologies that help make it livable for an astronaut. Well, we've done those. We've invented a lot of those technologies already so that the astronauts on another world, the moon or whatever, can be sustainable. But we don't do that at home very well. We don't adopt those same practices in our day-to-day -day lives as to how we operate global society. The operating system of the planet is not very sustainable. So the purpose of my lecture is to show people what we're capable of on a technical level not going over their head, but just giving them the concepts and the ideas. I'm not trying to outsmart anyone, just so that anybody can understand it. And then take it to the next level and say, okay, if we have this potential, what's holding us back? Why aren't we using it the right way? And I go into that a little bit, which leads towards the resource-based economic model mindset of thinking. That's really... <laughs> what started it all, yeah, in a way? what started it all. Well, when I, when I got involved... Let me go back. I saw the original Zeitgeist film, which obviously has nothing to do with the movement. But I saw that and I thought, well, that's an interesting way to package up some of the problems or at least looking at things a little bit differently or, or whatever. But I'm like, OK, we'll see. Whatever. It was interesting. Cool. I've got other things to do. Um, then Addendum came out and I saw that and I saw more complaining. But then at the end, I saw a solution set, a potential solution set. That's when the engineer and the scientist in me went, aha. Now we're going past complaining and we're getting into answers. How can we possibly solve these problems? Because no, no scientific progress was ever made about just sitting around a table complaining all the time. <laughs> so solution-oriented. Solution-oriented. And when I saw the solutions, I thought, well, that sounds kind of familiar because I'm familiar with the history of space exploration and some of the concepts that were thought of and how... We would, the original plan of going to the moon wasn't just going to the moon and coming home and that was it. It was going to the moon, it was building a space station, it was 
you know, building a moon base. There were bigger, better plans. Of course, global conflicts and wars and Vietnam and other things can really derail a good scientific, you know, mission. But the concepts were being fleshed out. How do you be sustainable on another world? So it wasn't really a new idea, but it was packaged in a much better way when I saw what the Venus Project was doing. And that's when I started doing additional research and trying to find other organizations. I couldn't find a catchy little video that wasn't two and a half hours long. Mm -hmm. And so I made one. <laughs> so that was your first step, how you started your activism. Right, exactly. Right. right. And that basically, I guess you could say my activism started when I made Awakening. Mm -hmm. That was my way of putting together my knowledge of, of film or whatever and being able to grab information and data points and put them together in a quasi-entertaining fashion. I jokingly say to my father, I said to my dad when I uploaded it, I said, I'll be lucky if I get 40 people to see this thing. And then <laughs> I had about 400 views a day for a month <laughs> on, on Awakening, which really surprised me. I'm sure Peter Joseph, we're probably in the similar mindset when that happened, because I'm sure when he made his original Zeitgeist, he was like, oh, whatever. And then it went, Phew. and the same thing happened with Awakening. And now I've been blessed with the fact that so many people liked it because it's short. It, it hits the key points. People can watch it relatively quickly and, and, and if it can drive them, it's like a, like a primer. It gets them moving towards maybe doing additional research. Now it's in like 25 different languages. It's been put on DVDs and spread everywhere. And I'm very happy that I was able to contribute something to, to help people get that awareness out there. That's a good feeling. Cybernated farm systems. Cybernated only basically means that it's computer controlled, automated with robots inside that do a, the lion's share of the labor and things like that. So that's really where cybernated comes from. Uh, and it's a farm system. So basically a 5,000 square foot building or putting it in metric terms about 464 square meters, that one, a building of that size, I can feed 1,600 people 10 different fruits and vegetables each per person. The building is off the grid, meaning that I can put it anywhere in the middle of the desert with no infrastructure, no power or nothing, and it will work because it's solar and wind powered. It collects rain. It has storage facilities built into it. It's its own little self-sustaining island, and all it does is make food for the people that it serves. And the, the, the concept is to work with governments, humanitarian groups, mm -hmm. global organizations that want to save lives get these buildings into the impoverished regions of the world where they don't have an infrastructure. They don't have a way to plug in, quote unquote. So what this will do is allow them to get food without having to be plugged in. We're just going to bring the factory to them and it will make food. And once their bellies are full and they're not starving to death and literally turning to dust in front of our eyes, then we can work on education processes. I'm going to teach them how the building works. It's going to be a step-by-step -step process of bringing them up to the 21st century, starting first by feeding them. Um, I have a question. It's solar powered, so but it can work even in the places where there is no sun. Right. It'll be solar and wind. So it's okay, both. So. It's a combo. And of course, the buildings will be modified and adjusted based on the geography of where they are. If we're looking at a place like, say, Iceland wants them, yeah. I'll go geothermal. We'll try to make it a geothermal powered building instead. So it depends on what's appropriate for the region that it's going to. But when you're looking at sub-Saharan Africa, solar and wind is the dominating force. And if you're looking at Australia, different parts of Australia, also solar and wind. Uh, but you come up here, say to Scandinavian North, a lot less sun <laughs> during the majority of the year. So solar would not be as efficient. So we would look at wind, battery banks, and maybe if we can tap a geothermal, find something, use waste heat from a factory that's doing one process and partner with them and have the farm be next door so that you can tap their waste heat and maybe generate power off of that. Different kinds of ways of working with the existing infrastructure. So you uh, uh, will, you would adopt um, to the conditions of the country that you want to? Exactly. Just like humans adapt to their surroundings, these buildings will be set up to adapt to whatever's available in their region. Mm -hmm. I, I will admit that I don't know that much about aeroponics. I haven't done enough research mm -hmm. on it personally myself, so I can't speak to that. But the difference between hydroponics and aquaponics is basically this. Aquaponics is hydroponics mixed with aquaculture. Aquaculture is fish farms. So you have aquaculture, so there's the aqua bit, 
and then hydroponics, there's the ponic bit. So you mix them together and you have aquaponics. The difference is that hydroponics uses chemical fertilizers, uh, uh, manufactured liquid nutrients that you would put in the water, and then that would go to the plants and then they would eat that. Aquaponics is taking a fish tank and letting nature do its thing. The fish dirty the water, that the, the plants want that, so you filter that off to the plants, and you move that to the plants, the plants suck the nutrients out of that using various ways that have been established. Aquaponics is a viable working system. We don't have to invent anything new to make that work. And then after that water is cleaned, you run it through some additional filters and it goes right back into the fish tank. So it's a closed loop system. So you're not wasting anything. Everything's being recycled and reused on a continual basis. And when it comes to like feeding the fish, people ask, you know, do you have to bring in fish food from the outside? No. They're, there's tilapia fish. They eat a plant called duckweed. Duckweed grows in the water. So that's all there. That's its own closed loop. The duckweed feeds the fish and the fish in a way feed the duckweed. So that's a closed loop system. And so this is set up so that once you turn the building on, once you flip the switch, you don't have to touch it again. Uh, is it sufficient uh, to use hydroponics on a small scale, like a small vegetable garden, window farming, for example? Yes, yeah, it's becoming quite popular, yes. What I'm doing is industrial scale, specifically for regions of the world that are broken, that really can, but people in, in major cities can do local, in their own window, hydroponic systems. They can even do aquaponic if you have a fish tank of appropriate size and you can maintain it. Uh, you can set up timers and little computer control systems to manage the lion's share of the work, the majority of the work, so that you don't have to do too much. But th there are definitely in-house ways of, of doing this so that you can grow some of your own things. Um, so what is the potential uh, when it comes to feeding the world? You say it's uh, how many people you can feed? 1,600. 1,600. So uh, you just uh, distribute, uh, you install this uh, system, give it to people? Yeah, flood the world with these buildings. And yes. then the world will be... <laughs> yes, the world will be fine. That's the kind of an idealistic approach to it. But it is, that's kind of the long-term goal. If I don't have that goal in mind, then what am I doing this for? The whole point is my goal is to feed the entire planet with these buildings. That's the goal. Am I ever going to reach it? I don't know. We'll see what happens. But that's, I think that's a, an honorable goal to move towards. And so, but it's not just about my buildings because there's only so much I can grow mm -hmm. with this. There's limits to what you can grow. So you would use excess waste and turn that into compost. And then that could go into the soil of that region. And then they can grow items that can't be grown in the buildings, like long stock wheat, so that they can make bread and stuff. So you have wheat grain, grain fields, so have grains. I can't grow grains in, in these buildings. Uh, right. Uh, I can't grow a heavy, I can't grow a watermelon. You know, I can't grow apple trees, not, not in the systems that I'm using. Now, can we later on go back in um, use, use the monies that I make and reinvest them back into building tree farmhouses and things like that? Absolutely. And that's a plan that I have. We're going to work with other industries that are good with doing that. And we'll partner together and we'll build those. And so by the end of the day, it'll be a whole bunch of humanitarian-minded corporations, CSRs, they're uh, corporate social responsible entities that will be working together to better mankind not for the sake of making a whole bunch of money, whatever about that. It's about saving people's lives and doing good for the planet and ourselves. Sounds good. Um, so uh, how would you estimate how, how much time we need before um, this your project comes true? Before I start going into operations? Uh, before y you flood the people. <clears throat> oh, flood the world? <laughs> flood the world. Well, um, I did the numbers on this once. It's, it's crazy. I couldn't do it by myself. I'm going to need help. It would take like 150 years if I sold 2,500 buildings a month. You know, it, it would because yeah. there's 6 billion people on the planet. But see, it doesn't have, these buildings actually don't have to go around the world. I mean, like, like you mentioned before, being, people being able to grow some stuff locally at home. Mm -hmm. 
Then there is traditional farming, which works to a point. The problem with traditional farming in the third world is logistics and shipping and cost and yada yada, all these little compound influences that we add um, that make it difficult to get them food. So I'm bypassing all of that and putting the food factory right in their own backyard. But that's not necessarily needed for, say, a place in the Midwest of the United States where they have a robust farming industry locally already. So they don't necessarily need that. And so far, what have you achieved with your company? What is, what's, what is your current state of events? Sure. Right now, I'm in the middle of phase one, research and development. There's mm -hmm. two phases. Phase one, research and development, is the development of a low-power grow light. Because right now, the current technologies that are there, it's all 100-watt, 200-watt, 500-watt bulbs to grow these plants, specialized bulbs. The problem is it's way too much power. I cannot be green, clean, wind and solar powered. I, don't, I wouldn't generate enough energy to power that. So I've designed a way to drop it down to about 20 watts. I'm going from 100 basically down to 20. If that works and does what it's supposed to do, which is what we're testing right now, that's in process. In fact, I turned it on two days before I hopped on the plane to come here. So it's in the process of doing its stuff right now. I finally bought it. I got the funding that I needed and I bought all the parts that I needed to put this thing together. And so if that does what it's supposed to, and I'm quite confident that it will, then we move into phase two operations, which is the building of a prototype. Mm -hmm. That is where we get the larger investment funding, we get the robots, we, bu we build a building, we get the solar panels and the wind and all that stuff. Not a full-scale big building, but just a smaller one, because... That, then it's just scaling after that. It's just making the building a little bigger. But the programs that run the robots, the programs that control the climate, that's going to be the same no matter what building you build. So the prototype will establish all of those, what are called baseline parameters. That will, that's what you call it in, in engineering or technical fields, baseline parameters. Once the baselines are set up, mm -hmm. then it's just repeatable after that. Then you just scale it up a little bit and you just keep rolling with it after that. And I forecast that I'll be ready to go in less than 12 months. If things go according to plan and schedule, phase one will be done in the next month or so. Phase two will take about nine months to do. So we're looking at a year or less and I'll have working systems that we can start put, customizing and putting out there. Sounds good. Uh, now I want to turn to my favorite part of the interview. I want to talk about the future of Tiger movement okay. and witness process the way you see it. <clears throat> okay. So uh, when I was when I watched for the first time the second the third movie of Tiger's movie, in the end you have this beautiful scene: people get rid getting rid of money, everybody is so free, liberated, and happy. I want to live in this society. I do, but I really want to know uh, how we get there. What is the transition? What will it take? Will it be like? peaceful demonstration like Arab Spring for example, I don't know, uh, like um, boycotts of the unhealthy production. What what do you think? How do you picture this? That's not a loaded question at all. <laughs> huh? How's the future of mankind going to fix itself? <coughs> um. no, but I, I ask because you, you are... Uh, giving the dreams, the ideas right, right. to people. So I actually, I cover this in the end of my lecture. Mm. And what I basically say is this. You need to do what you're passionate about. Some people are good street activists. I'm not. That's not what I do. Mm. I am more of the formal university lecture type person. Mm. And I'm starting my own company with that goal in mind. The long-term goal is to erode the need for money. I really don't see that idealistic at the end of the film. It's a great image of throwing all the money back at the banks and going, blah, we don't want it anymore. I don't think it's quite going to happen that way. But what could happen is the erosion of the necessity for money. If I can make money less necessary for food, by doing these buildings, it's a one-time cost. They buy into the building once and they never have another cost again for those 10 fruits and vegetables. And then we do it again and again and again and we just repeat that. Now food effectively is free, right? Okay, so now I have more money in my wallet to go party. Yay! Well, now let's do that with energy. And now let's do that with transportation. And now let's, you start going down the domino effect of eroding the need for money. People are going to have all this money, but they're not going to have a lot of bills. 
eventually people are going to start asking the question themselves, what do I need all this stuff for? My shelter, food, energy. It's, I, I did a one-time cost like 20 years ago and I haven't had to pay for it since. And we work together to maintain the building. So every once in a while we get called upon to go, do a quick check on it or whatever. Uh, so that really doesn't harm me in any way. I can do that. So then they start asking the question themselves. We have to slowly bring about the environment. It's an environmental adjustment. Bring about the environment that will call, cause the mental adjustment. But it's both at the same time. You couldn't just, obviously we've said this many times, you can't drop the RBE on the planet and expect people today to be able to function in it. They wouldn't get it. They're so used to money and acquisition and property and wealth and all these status symbols that go with it that they, they'd probably have a coronary. They wouldn't know how to operate in that kind of a system. But if you erode over time, like an ocean will chop at a cliff face, that, that need for money, that is how you get people to on their own, adopt a different way of thinking because they get immersed in it. There's a lot of ways to do that. Start a company like I did. If you have the knowledge and the expertise and a particular passion about a subject, do that. Start a nonprofit, a conglomerate group that can take in funding from outside sources that does betterment uh, beautification or help in a city or a town. Uh, work with a CSR, a corporately social responsible company. They're, they're starting to become, they're called social entrepreneurs. I just have an issue with social uh, responsibility because, as far as I know, uh, there is no um, there is no standards actually elaborated for CSR for the companies to comply with. It's getting there's there's a CSR 2.0 that's come out. Yeah, I, I know right? that also. And they work they said like a nonprofit and a for profit together, but the nonprofit has like 50 percent of the board members of the profit. And the profit gives 10% kickback to the nonprofit, and they work together to keep them in check. But at some point, you've got to trust that the people that are starting these entities are really going to do what they say they're going to do. There has to be some trust in your fellow man. And if they say, if I say, my goal is to feed people and reinvest that money back into the system and keep feeding people, there are ways to check and balance that. There are ways to, to monitor that. So if people get into the right organizations and they don't find that somebody's being fishy or whatever, then that's a way that they can help. They can start their own too. Start your own. There's, there's microfinancing out there. iGenius.org is an institution based out of the UK that does micro funding and financing for socially conscious companies that are trying to do better things in the world, whether it's water cleaning. They've got a couple of companies that they support for that, things like that. That's how people can get involved. But you've got to find what resonates with you. Don't try to do... I get emails a lot on Facebook. What? Douglas, what kind of engineering discipline should I get into? I don't know. Do you even want to get in engineering? <laughs> I mean, that's an important question first. Are you doing it because you think that's what the world needs? Or are you doing it because that's what you want to do? Big difference. You need to do what you love. Try to make that your passion and move that towards the future world. Don't just do what you think might be necessary because if you suck at it or, or it's not fulfilling you in a really deep way and you're just doing it be for an ulterior motive like, oh, I just want to bring about the RBE so I'm going to become an electrical engineer. Well, if you don't like it, that's not really going to help anybody in the long run. So find what you're passionate about and run with that. Uh, who do you think should establish these rules and uh, who should enforce them? Mm. or to make people obey these rules. Um, in other words, what kind of political structure do you think it can support? It would be drastically diminished from what it is today. Uh, when people think about who would enforce the rules, what are the rules supposed to do? So you have to look at what are the rules on the books. Most of the rules, and you can categorize these, are, are just designed to keep people from messing with other people, right? You can't take my property, so there's a rule against stealing. You can't uh, uh, take uh, uh, something from somebody else or something like that. Um, you can't hurt somebody else. So there's rules against that, the laws that we have in place. But you have to go back to the core of why are people behaving that way in the first place. And then if you really take that to its full scientific and logical conclusion, it doesn't really take a rocket scientist to figure this one out. If you have five people on an island with one coconut tree, that's probably not going to be a good idea. You're going to get bad behavior no matter how nice they say they are because there's not enough food. 
But if you put 100 coconut trees on there with the same five people, they're not going to behave that way anymore. Why? Because there's more than enough. So in case one, you need to develop a bunch of rules to equitably share the coconuts so that nobody beats up anybody else for their coconuts. In case two, there's no need for a rule for that because there's more than enough coconuts. So what are you going to make a rule for? There's an abundance of coconuts. If you take that process to its fruition and look at all of the different things that we can make in abundance, a lot of the rules that we have, they just go away. And they don't go away because, you know, we want anarchy and the world to be a crazy place. They go away because they're not relevant anymore. There's no justification to have a rule to stop someone from stealing when you live in a world where there's an abundance of everything that somebody needs to survive. So what are they going to steal? What's the point of stealing? So those rules eradicate themselves when you improve the system. Now, it's not something that you can just do right away. You're gonna, it's going to be like the erosion of money. It'll be the erosion of those rules. Some rule, they'll just start to be chipped away. We don't need that one anymore. We don't really need that one anymore over time. Likewise with the police forces or the any forces that are set to enforce them. As the rules go down, the need for all of that goes down. And likewise with government. What is government supposed to do? Really, it's supposed to maintain the security of the people and govern commerce, economic transfers between nations. Well, if you start developing a robust global society that's more cooperative instead of competitive economically, I'm okay with competition for like sports, but economic competition kills people. And so if you, you get to that place where governments become drastically reduced, you want to talk about the reduction of government, a lot of politics say make government smaller. Okay, make access bigger <laughs> so that people don't have to need a big government to help them. So that will just over time dwindle itself down. Do I know what the final result is going to be? No, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't look into the future and know how it's going to manifest 50 years from now. But I know that's the process. Um, but still, you have a um, planet Earth mm -hmm. uh, with finite resources. Right. Right. Uh, if we want to manage these resources, <coughs> there should be a system that manages these resources, right? Uh, right. Uh, so, um, I, I personally, I don't really um, picture how you would say to one person that, for example, you shouldn't have two cars because it's not ecologic, because you can use uh, electrical cars instead, because it's more in environmental. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more about, I'm asking about how you, it's a question of freedom of the right. person. Okay. So, in a way... Um, um, maybe I'll more talk about the transition period. Um, as you say, in the end, everybody ha will have a uh, uh, different state of mind. But um, maybe I'm not talking about the transition period. How would you explain? Or Well, you can explain, but still it's like you take a, a freedom of a person away when you say... I guess it depends on what's your definition of freedom. Does somebody define freedom as their ability, ability to do whatever they want, even if it hurts somebody else? Unfortunately, we don't quite separate the two very well in today's world. So people think they're entitled to, I can do whatever I want. I'm free. The problem is if that action is causing 50 people to die, that's a behavior that should be socially unacceptable, period. So the question is, does the freedom infringe upon other people's freedoms? their ability to live or to be comfortable as well because this isn't a one-sided monopoly game we only have one planet and if we don't coexist and work together we're going to self-destruct so you get back to the how do you manage the resources well first you've got to do the accounting method method you got to find out how much you have to work with now it's not just knowing what you've got to work with you have to make sure that everything you do is reduces waste drastically we waste so many resources these days by throwaway systems, entire cell phones that get thrown away when the only thing they've upgraded is a small chip, when you should just change out the chip, not the whole phone. So there are systems that we can put in place over time that will reduce waste, that will increase efficiency to where that car lasts a lot longer, that the electric car is now just as po as powerful as the gas one that you had before, so you just do a swap out. So you still have the same freedom. You still basically have the same car, but one is more responsible than the other one. 
So that's how you get to those places. You don't take away people's freedoms, but you do educate people on how better to manage their freedoms. And uh, about uh, the system that, uh, of management of resources, how would you, is it uh, possible technically to prevent other people to take advantage of this system? Like can, can people take advantage of like a resource-based economic model? Yeah. Have you thought about it? It'd be, I have and I can't think of a way where somebody could pull that off. And here's why. <clears throat> You're talking about a planet that's globally integrated with the city system hubs, just like maybe two or three hundred of these mega cities that are production hubs for regions, like regional districts or however you want to term it. Terminology is irrelevant. And then these systems provide an abundance of the biological needs and the quality of life needs of the people in, in concert together of the entire planet. How could somebody game abundance? How do you take... How do you hoard more for yourself or get power or control over systems that are decentralized? Now, in today's world, we have a lot of centralized systems. People talk about central planning and communism. They throw out all these words. Look at just the energy grid as an example. Somebody could game the energy grid really easily. It's called destroying the energy plant or, or a nuclear meltdown or nature can do it. Look what happened with Japan and the, tsunami, the earthquake and the tsunami. You have a central power structure. When it goes down, everybody goes down. Then you can't store food. People start to die. No waste, no sanitation controls. You've got all these issues, right? Because it's a centralized power grid. In the resource-based economic model, every building is its own partial contributor of clean energy power to the entire grid. So if one building goes down, the rest of them generate enough power to feed that building anyway. So it's, it puts it in dynamic equilibrium. You have a, a dynamic grid that ebbs and flows and adjusts itself when something goes negative or positive. The building could be done for the day and everybody goes home, but it's still generating power through wind and solar or whatever, but all the lights are off and they'd be automated. So when you walk out of the room, all the lights cut off. They're all LED power, so the wattage is really low. So you're creating all this energy now, but the building's not really in use. It's dormant. So what are you going to do with that extra energy? We'll say there's another building 20 miles down the road that needs a little more juice. So that the automated system will automatically filter that excess energy to that building, but it does it at the speed of light. You don't even notice it. It just does it. So you don't have to manage and maintain that so specifically. But it's decentralized. You can't game a decentralized system because what are you going to do? Take out one building? Well, there's like 50 others that can cover the difference. How are you going to game the food system if there's thousands of buildings all over the place or that are generating food? What are you going to do? Take over one? How are you going to game that? You really can't. And anybody who tries honestly has a mental issue. That, 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 goes, beyond, that goes beyond just being a bad person with a bad behavior. If you're living in a world that is abundantly, uh, provides abundant access of the things that you need to live and live well and somebody is still trying to game the system or something, that's a mental disorder. That's something that doctors and PhDs could take care of and try to figure out why is this person chemically imbalanced to want to do that? What is up with that guy? That's how that would be handled. That's why prisons would become so inconsequential in most respects because anybody who behaves badly when things are good, it's the person needs to be analyzed as a human being, as a biological creature, not as just some, oh, throw him in jail. That doesn't solve the problem. You need to figure out why that person behave that way. And that's a scientific and medical process. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a question about, uh, you were talking about that concrete project that could be implemented. Uh, <clears throat> the sample city, uh, which is fully sustainable. Right. Uh, and for this, you need a lot of resources, money, a lot of um, cooperation, right. also with the governments. Right. And governments nowadays, um, and um, sometimes uh, take advantage of the system, let's right. say. Right, right. <laughs> uh, lots of them are corrupt. Do you think that this cooperation can influence the ideology of the project, of the Venus project and the uh, Tagate movement itself? You Try it one more time. Would the corruption that are in governments have an influence on... Because when you cooperate with the <coughs> government, right. uh, they always think in a way how... Uh, how we can, oh, yes, 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 we've really got to get better at using the system 
but to our advantage. Yes, people are going to want to make a profit. I'm starting a for-profit company. Does that make me a bad person? No, it's called using the system. I've got to use the tools that are at my fingertips. It's a lot easier for me to start a for-profit than a non-profit. It takes me two years to do a non-profit. It took me four days to set up a company. Big difference. So I can get things going now. So the question then becomes, how do we, how do we work with people? Sure, they're going to want their profit. Or they're going to want a piece of the pie. Okay, they'll get their piece of the pie. In the long run, we're going to influence so many other lives by getting that system implemented that over the course of the next generation, we got to think in terms of longer than just our own happy little lives. The next generation is going to see that influence and eventually the government part of it isn't going to be as relevant as the lives that we've benefited from it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for this very interesting conversation. Uh, I hope you will enjoy the rest of the tour. I thank you very much. In uh, Norway. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, oh, that's right. I can't move. I forgot I'm chained. <laughs>